Okay, so um, just as Mr. K um, introduced, I'm, I think most of you may know, um, I am Miss Lazarus and I am the uh, Mental Health and Wellbeing Lead at um, Greenridge Primary Academy. I am currently completing my Masters in Mental Health and Wellbeing in Education um, and we thought it would be a really good idea um, to share some of that information that I think would hopefully be useful for you as parents to support your children. They've gone through so much this past year and you may be noticing maybe some children, some of your children have um, possible symptoms of anxiety and um, you may notice some other behaviours that um, you may be a bit concerned about and you may not have and you just want to find out a little bit more of how you can help your child um, with their mental health and well-being. And if you do, if you do find that I'm um, too quiet or I'm going too fast, please let me know in the chat box. Um, I won't be offended. I haven't done this in a long time. So um, what we're going to do now is going to talk about um, mental health and well-being as a whole child from even if your children are in nursery up to year five at the moment hopefully you will find something um, and you'll take something from this and then next year Mr Kay and I are hoping to possibly um, make them a little more um, specific to children in early years he's stage one and he's stage two but um, we haven't got a lot of time so I thought I'd start um, going through now um, and hopefully you will find it helpful I've got a few notes that I um, may read off during the presentation as well. So the aims of this session, hopefully you will gain an insight into um, why your child may be behaving in a certain way. Um, we also want to talk about emotional regulation and why it's important for children and adults to support your child um, managing anxiety and what anxiety looks like with children and also to support your child to ma manage some frustrated and angry feelings well. So we've thought of some strategies to support you with that. And some of this information has actually come from an educational psychologist um, who gave some information that I found really useful and I've actually shared with the members of staff here at Greenridge. So um, we thought it might be useful for you and hopefully it is as well. Um, now, hopefully, it's um, Mr. K will tell me if it hasn't gone on the next slide. Um, but hopefully, this shows a little bit of statistics. Um, I wasn't sure whether to show you this or not because the statistics are from 2017, and I do actually think we have um, the statistics here have risen, especially with COVID and the pandemic. Um, I think we have found that we have more and more children with possible anxiety and uh, mental health problems, and we feel that we need to support them. And so in terms of this slide, you will not be surprised to hear that mental health issues are on the rise. So here um, are some statistics and some key points. Interestingly, I was reading some research recently, but this was from 2000. One in 10 young people had a diagnosable mental health issue. In 2017, they identified 20%, which is a huge difference. So that shows mental health issues are on the rise, and I think even more, and especially since, as I said before, the pandemic, um, I think that is especially going to be on the rise. So it, it's essential that we try and support, we try and work together um, as pa parents and practitioners to support your children as well. Um, we do know that initially rates are higher in girls than boys, but boys do catch up with those mental health issues in teenage years. Anxiety disorders are the most common issue. Generally, mental health issues increase with age. Psychologists have seen a noticeable change of the number of children referred to clinicians for mental health issues, which is really worrying, but something that we want to support the children with as well. And emotional disorders are more common in five to 15 year olds. Half of all mental health issues present themselves by the age of 14, which is a lot, and 75% by the age of 84. Oh, sorry, 24. Um, but something that's not on there, something to think about um, for you as parents is that, um, interestingly, anxiety rates um, are actually higher in the age group 45 to 55 year olds, known as the sandwich generation. And often they have dependent children, but also elderly parents they're having to look after. So there's a stress on them catering on both ages is very high. So um, I'm throwing that in there just because I want to show that anxiety issues are everybody's um, issues. 
we all have anxiety and that is completely normal but it's when it takes over our life and when an emotional issue takes over our life and distort those normal habits that's when it becomes an issue and so we want to prevent that and we want to support children and yourselves and in that as well um, so, so all of these statistics here refer to an actual diagnosed condition so think about all those conditions especially at the moment when we're trying to refer children and adults are trying to refer themselves um, and they haven't actually been diagnosed with any conditions that's the tip of the iceberg these, um, these statistics so it doesn't relate to the rest of the children that haven't been to the gp or haven't had a diagnosis from a cans clinician um, from the child mental health um, service um, or a paediatrician so we do know we have a big mental health issue so this is why we want to work together to to be able to support yourselves and, and the children as well. So in terms of what anxiety is, um, anxiety is a feeling of worry or, or fear. It's experienced as a combination of physical sensations, thoughts and feelings, and we're going to discuss that in a moment. All children and young people feel worried. It's completely normal. I want to stress that, and I think you know, and you probably are, are reflecting that on that yourselves, Especially the past year and a half, we have all felt anxiety. It becomes a problem when um, a young person or a child feels stuck in it, or when those feelings become overwhelming, distressing, and unmanageable. So, um, if you feel that your child is struggling with anxiety, there are things that we can um, do to support them. When you can do to support them, practical strategies, um, and possibly finding professional help if they do need it. But, at the moment it's very difficult to get that professional help so um, we want to be able to put things in place before they hopefully do get that if you feel that your child does need it but this is also for early help as well even if you only see um, a few um, behaviors that you are concerned about as well now there are lots of things that can make children um, feel anxious a young person may feel anxious for a number of different reasons depending on themselves if your child is feeling an unmanageable amount of worry and fear this may be a sign that something in their life isn't quite right and they just need a little bit of support to work out what that problem is um, and there's a few examples on here so experiencing lots of change in a short period of time having responsibilities that are beyond their age and development and um, possibly being around someone who is very anxious. And I'm going to be talking about those mirror neurons and um, something as humans that we um, mirror in terms of behaviors. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And um, they may be struggling at school, finding school difficult, and that could cause anxiety, they might be experiencing family stress, or they may have been through distressing or traumatic experiences as well. Um, so here are some symptoms. I'm not going to read through all of them. And this, these slides will be available if you do want to come back to them. Um, but you have pan uh, sorry, physical symptoms, such as panic attacks, the shallow or quick breathing, dry mouth. You also have symptoms linked to thoughts and feelings. And then the coping behaviours that come with it as well. So in terms of the thoughts and feelings, it could be preoccupied, distracted, worrying about really small things, being alert to different noise, smells, signals, being overwhelmed, and then the coping behaviours we may see or you may see um, from your child. So repeating certain behaviours, withdrawing or isolating themselves, eating more or less, so a change in um, feeding habits as well. Um, and that brings me on to emotional regulation. Now, as adults, we have um, we have learnt and kind of taught ourselves strategies to cope with um, difficult situations um, daily. Um, now, as children, children need to develop that, um, and they need to learn how to cope with difficult situations as well. So emotional regulation is a person's ability to manage and respond to an emotional experience effectively. As we get older, we've learned a set of tools that enable us to deal with difficult situations. Children don't have that. So what we need to do is help them to build up that toolbox 
but they, as adults, are able to manage more effectively. So we want to provide them with some strategies so that they can um, have really good well-being and support themselves deal with those difficult situations that unfortunately um, do arise in life. Um, now, emotional regulation strategies are what we need to help us adapt to our environment and cope with the stresses of daily life. We know that the stresses for some people are much greater than others. The great thing about the human body is that it's primed to, um, to find this balance, this status. Our emotions, our hormones work to maintain this balance. So anxiety might rise and our stress hormones rise. But what happens is that we actually have other hormones kick into place to try and calm us down. And the more strategies that we have and we learn, the more we are able to help ourselves calm down manage our emotions. So I'm going to talk about those um, hormones in a moment. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Um, I've had to um, go over it a few times myself as well. So what we're going to talk about today is hopefully useful everyday strategies to help manage normal stresses for your child. Um, and this will help with significant issues. But if you, if you feel your child um, has more severe mental health issues, um, you will need to seek greater support. And, and I'll talk about how we can do that after um, the session. Now, what we know from research is that emotionally healthy people have a lot of strategies that they use, whereas people who have possibly experienced trauma um, or early abuse tend to have a few, very few strategies because um, they're locked in that survival mode, which is what I'm going to talk about in a moment. And it does make it very difficult for them to use solutions, which is what we're going to look at later. So in terms of um, what happens when we feel dysregulated, so this might be um, when something has happened with your child and they have felt like they have been unable to control um, their emotions due to that um, that trigger. So it's something called a fight or flight uh, response. So what I want you to think about is how you feel when you are emotionally dysregulated. Something has happened that has caused you to feel a huge emotion. We all have these chemicals and often what educational psychologists say to parents and children is that we are actually a bag of chemicals and those hormones within us will react to the environment so if we are in a stressful environment, our adrenaline and our cortisol rise. And that's when, um, when that happens, it's done to enable that cortisol, sorry, cortisol to help us to survive. And it's called our fight or flight response. So as you can see in this picture, that fight or flight response, um, there are physical symptoms from that. So we may sweat, um, we may breathe heavier as well. And when we feel anxious, those are the hormones, the adrenaline and cortisol are the main hormones related to stress. And those hormones will rise when we are in a stressful environment. And so those feelings are shown in the picture that is on the right. And on the next slide, um, what, other, what else happens is our heart beats faster. And what it's trying to do is pump that blood to the muscles to get ready for that fight or flight response. And when that happens, we get these symptoms. So the heartbeat increases to get the blood pumping around the body. Our breathing gets faster. So we've got more oxygen in the muscles. The muscles become tense, particularly if adrenaline, if adrenaline is around for some time and cortisol comes in, which is the hormone that particularly ties those muscles, and particularly if it's around for some time. We know at times that our emotional regulation system, which is our central nervous system, can also lead to shortened breath. And that's when people tend to have the panic attack and start to do very shallow breath. We get hot and as a result can shut down, the stomach shuts off, um, salivation shut down. And that's why when you often get stressed, your mouth can be quite dry. Um, and also um, this, uh, the blood is directed away from the fingers and toes. So that's why you can feel quite cold in your main muscles as well. Again, ready for that fight or flight response. Now, these can be um, responses, um, sorry, the blood is directed away from that, and these can be normal reactions. But what happens is that children may experience these 
um, responses and these things, but they don't know what they're experiencing. So can you imagine how they may feel if they're experiencing all these feelings and these emotions? And they might feel that it might, they might be having a heart attack. Um, does it mean that I'm, if they're having those shallow breaths that some people um, have, does it mean that I'm going to stop breathing? I won't be able to breathe. And then that sets up more panic. Am I going to get a headache because I'm too hot? And children can read into those negative things and, and into those physical symptoms. And what we've got to say to them is these um, feelings and these symptoms are completely normal, but what we've got to do is manage them. So children are these big bags of chemicals, but they're naive, they're immature, and they don't know what's happening. So what they tend to do is try in their very immature way at the moment, and manage their emotional physiology that's going on in them. So what they tend to do is the fight or flight or freeze. Um, so you may notice this um, in your child, or it may not have happened yet, but you may notice some more um, kind of children that possibly go through the freeze response if when they are panicked. And um, so here they might um, hit out, they might run off, they might hide under a table or in extreme or extreme cases, they might start to disengage and close down um, and try and become as disassociated with the whole situation. And they present with these if their body is psychologically triggered. And what we need to do is work with them to educate them, to recognize these feelings, and then learn to have some coping strategies to, to deal with them. And I'm going to move on to that um, soon. Um, before I do, I wanted to just show you um, this quote um, I think it can be really difficult when um, as a parent your child may be experiencing some um, difficult emotions and um, they may be quite challenging with you um, but it's all it's we have to as adults try and, and remember that actually no kid no child is a bad child um, it's just that emotion underneath. They're trying to express their feelings um, and needs the only way they need, they, they know how. So I thought it just a nice um, reminder for all of us um, as parents and as practitioners, as teachers, um, that they are just trying to um, maybe share their emotions and they just don't know how. Um, here is another great model that I really like, um, the um, iceberg model. So often most anger is underpinned by actually anxiety or insecurity and for many children it's also a sign they might be frustrated and um, it could be they're frustrated um, at home at school we see this at school as well um, equally they may be overexcited we know how some children get at christmas um, overexcited and we may see different behaviors from them as well at that time um, and when we're talking about emotional regulation and supporting the children, it's about all the emotions they experience. And um, so it's not just about the anger, the anxiety, it's also um, talking, thinking about grief, thinking about nervousness, being annoyed um, and overexcited as well. So it's just uh, something to think about and something that um, is a really nice way to um, show why a child may be angry or may be showing those um, emotions. Um, and here I also wanted to talk about, which I thought was really useful for our staff as well. And um, what the key thing is that we all experience these emotions and they are all normal and that's OK. What we want them to do is recognise that it's OK to have these feelings, but it's not OK to hurt anyone with it. That we don't want them to hurt themselves with it. Um, and a, an important message that we want to give your, um, give your child is I can see your emotion. And that moves us on to um, the different emotions that we have. Um, and also something that um, I really liked from the, uh, one of the psychologists that did one of our lectures at uni, she said that we all need to wear a Teflon suit. So we can all acknowledge children's emotions, but not take them on. Being, in, being humans, in our brains, we have something called mirror neurons which causes us want to, to want to mirror the emotion that we're shown. So for example, if someone is angry at you, you are likely to feel angry back. Even if we don't want to, sometimes that just, we can't help it. If someone feels sad, we start to feel sad too. We find that um, a lot in maybe films. And it's just the way we work. 
So to help yourself not get um, absorbed into these emotions. So um, if your child is having a challenging day or um, they might be overtired um, and they, or they might be angry at you, they might be shouting at you, try not to absorb that. Put that Teflon suit on. Um, imagine yourself in a Teflon suit. It's normal to have, and say to yourself, it's normal for them to have these emotions, but I'm not going to take them on. Because if you take on the same emotions, you won't be as effective to help people take um, on their emotions, so your child's emotions as well. Um, now, there is a lot of theory behind emotional regulation, the fight, flight, um, and freeze response, uh, which I'm not going to go into too much because I think it'll be more important now to focus on how you can support um, your child at home as well. So first of all, um, we need adults who are emotionally aware. So when you're dealing with anyone who is emotionally aroused, the first thing we need to do is check on ourselves. Some people might know it as the airline technique. Um, so for example, when you're in an airplane, we're told if the masks drop, the first thing you do is put your oxygen mask on before helping others. So the first thing is um, when we need to do when we think about how we're feeling is to feel about how we're feeling ourselves, because if we're emotionally ar aroused, we may get triggered and that probably won't help the situation. So check yourself, calm yourself down before you interact with um, someone else, your child maybe, who is emotionally dysregulated. Um, I like to do, um, we're doing a lot more breathing techniques within class. Actually, it's helping myself um, as well. So it's just something to be mindful of um, when we're dealing with some challenging behaviours. Um, now, one of the psychologists, I, I think his name was John Gottman, but I um, don't need to know too much about that. Um, he says we need to attune to the needs of children. And here is his ac acronym. Um, so what we need to do to be aware of the emotions so you connect, identify the emotions so you can say to your child it's really important to name that emotion when you see that your child is uh, frustrated or angry you can say to them I can see that you are feeling frustrated, I can see that you're feeling angry, really important to turn toward them as well and, and I know you probably all do this as well um, already but it's just something it's good for us to have a, a gentle reminder of um, to, to complete things like this when, when we are in challenging situations. So um, apologies if you do do this already, it's just a good reminder for us as well. And so turn towards them. I always like to get down to a child's level and give them your time, be tolerant, listen to the emotions. And again, don't forget wearing that Teflon suit so you don't absorb those emotions. Try and be understanding, just naming that emotion makes other pe people and it will make your child feel that you completely understand them. It's one of the things I use really oh, quite often, naming that emotion is really, really helpful. So it, they understand what they're going, what you're, they're going through. And um, use non-defensive responding. So try not to judge, just listen to that emotion, <coughs> excuse me, and accept that that person is going through that and then use empathy as well, which is, understanding where that child is at. Try not to just dismiss the emotion or dismiss how they are. Um, try and, and be um, empathetic towards that emotion as well. So another strategy that, um, again, has worked so well since I had this lecture is something called controlled breathing. Um, and the first thing we need to do is control breathe. Well, apart from um, making sure that you, you as a, um, the parent is emotionally regulated, this strategy is um, amazing. Um, of course, we all breathe, but if you ask a dysregulated person to breathe, what they'll often do is take a, a deep breath in, but often their out breath is really short. So here's a chance that you can practice a deep breath. And when I practiced this, um, I found that actually it was really hard to make sure that the breathing out was longer than our breathing in. And um, so, here is kind of something to regulate your system. Your out breath needs to be much longer than your in breath. And I'm going to share some strategies that we do um, in school and something that you could possibly do at home that's more child um, it's, it's more child friendly rather than encouraging them to um, count in four and, and breathe out seven. There's other ways you can do it as well. But um, children in the older year groups will be able to do this as well. 
So I'd like you to try. And um, so this technique is four, seven. So breathe in for four and out for seven. And I found that quite hard to breathe out for seven. But the um, psychologist and the educational psychologist that shared this information, she said that um, she cannot underestimate the power of controlled breathing. She said that she gave an example of a child who she saw who had 200 vocal tics per lesson. And the educational psychologist only did it when she was, uh, sorry, the lady, the girl in the class only did it when she was anxious. So the educational psychologist taught her this controlled breathing technique. Um, and within a week, her vocal tics were down to four a day. And within three months, they had disappeared completely. Now, I know that's linked to vocal tics and um, your child may not um, have uh, vocal tics, but even this helps with anxiety um, and worry as well. Another really, really good technique um, that we that you could use um, and that we again, we sometimes use at school is to encourage the, your child to check out their senses. Um, again, you may have heard of this already. So when, you're, when a child is feeling unsafe, ask them to look around. What are their signs of safety? What can they see? What can they hear? Does it sound okay? What does it smell like? As long as we can't smell burning, anything like that, we're okay. Touch, touch your surroundings. Do they feel okay? Do they feel comfortable? Use your taste buds if you can. Get them to taste something and uh, talk about um, what they can taste. Really harness those senses. And actually, this is a good distraction technique. So I've just had to re-record this final part linked to um, how we can support um, our children and ourselves with the um, managing these emotions. Um, just because unfortunately on the first recording, the end part um, kind of messed up. So um, I'm going to just move on from the senses because I think I spoke through those. So this part is all about oxytocin. So um, what's great about the emotional system is that we've got our stress hormones. So that's things like the adrenaline and the cortisol. But on the other side, we've also got oxytocin. Um, now, oxytocin is our is also known as the feel good hormone, um, and that's boosted by having fun, and um, and our oxytocin levels will then rise, um, and we need that. We need food. We need cuddles. We need laughter. That all builds on that oxytocin, um, and this is what calms us down. Um, so it's just something to be aware of and something to be mindful of as well. And it really does kind of play a role in that social bonding. So you can encourage that with your child at home as well through that laughter, through that um, those cuddles um, and warm, nourishing food as well. Um, this was something interesting that an educational psychologist advised. Um, and it's possibly a nice strategy that you can use um, yourselves or with your children as well. Um, now, this educational psychologist um, that spoke about this explained that your brain is capable of taking you anywhere you want to go. So whether this is a, um, a nice, hot, sunny country, waves lapping, your brain can't recognise the emotion until we give it those words. So for example, if you say to yourself, I am sad, I am angry, and especially when you ask children to do that, what notice what happens to their face. And usually you'll notice that they kind of their uh, expression changes. They might slump a little bit. But if you say to yourself, I'm now happy, um, words can have an impact on our brain um, and determine in a temporary way how we're feeling. And um, so it's just something else that you can maybe try in those moments where you are finding that um, things can be a little bit tricky or you do want to just experiment with um, feelings and emotions as well with your children. Now, um, hopefully you um, are aware of the zones of regulation that we use within Greenridge. Um, they're a fantastic way to encourage children to understand their emotions and to support them to um, deal with their emotions in um, an appropriate way as well. Um, so here are the four zones. There are more, there's more information about the zones um, in detail on our website as well, on the Greenridge website. Um, and they depict the internal 
um, physiological states. So blue is more when we are down, when we're feeling sad, sick, bored, tired. Um, the green is when we're socially engaged. So we're ready to learn, we're happy. Yellow is for those feelings when we're kind of feeling a bit fizzy, frustrated, worried, might be a bit silly, might be a bit excited, overexcited. And then red is kind of when we have completely lost it or the child has completely lost it um, and we cannot engage at all um, in anything that we are trying to engage in or we should be engaging in. Um, so we can look at coping skills um, for these different zones in order to get back into the green zone if need be. Um, what's important to note is that maybe in the evening we do want to be a bit more in the blue zone because um, we are more tired and actually that's appropriate at the end of the day when we do need to go to sleep. Um, but it's just important to remember that as well. Um, now here um, is the toolbox that we use. We might use this for specific children. So again, you can use this for your child and sit them down and discuss, oh, what's, what tools if we're ever overexcited or if we're feeling worried or um, a bit anxious, if we're in that ye late yellow zone, what tools could we use to move into the green zone? So it could be going for a walk, it could be doing some exercise, it could even just be drinking lots of water, and it could even be doing some breathing techniques. Same with the red, breathing techniques are vital in the red when you're in the red zone. Um, and then blue zone are things to wake us up a bit more to go into the green zone. Um, but again, they might link to sadness as well. So things like breathing techniques, it could be um, a calming activity that they do. Um, on some children, they even have just some water on their face if they're feeling um, like they're in the blue zone if they're tired and then that will hopefully move them into the green zone as well and then the green zone tools are there to help us and um, stay in the green zone as well and so you could do this with your child and think of different tools that your child could use that would be helpful for them as well specific to them and um, this is another nice breathing technique um, and it's quite kind of physical um, and visual as well. So it's basically using their hand, encouraging them to sit comfortably and they use their other finger to breathe in as they go up the finger and breathe out as they go down. Breathe in and out and they continue that until they have finished around the hand. So that's quite a nice one to practice together. And again, you can model this to encourage yourself and um, to model and encourage your child and yourself to calm down in situations as well. Um, and it's great for you to model that in front of your child to show that there are appropriate strategies that we can use if we are feeling worried or anxious or upset or angry. And um, square breathing is another one. You could even draw a square, get your child to even if they have, you want them to have their own calming kit at home. You could get your child to draw a square. They could maybe decorate their breathing square. Um, and then again, they use their fingers quite visual for them. And um, they breathe in as they go across and then breathe, and then they hold and breathe out um, bottom and then hold. I encourage them to breathe slowly as well. So if they're giving them a responsibility to decorate that square, um, they might find it a bit more personal, a bit easier to use, a bit easier to use as well. Um, now, this is an idea that I think I took from um, a different website. I think it might even have been the NHS website. Um, so if you find that your child is worrying a lot throughout the day, um, you could encourage your child to collect their worries um, and then have a special envelope. And then at the end of the day, you could take, you could have a special worry time. This is when you talk through their worries. Um, and you could even have a table just like I have on um, this PowerPoint um, and plan out that worry time as well. And um, so that might be quite a, a nice activity rather than have lots of times throughout the day talking about your children's worries. And if you find that that's taking up a lot of time throughout the day, why not have a specific time um, every evening or even every morning it could be and um, to discuss those worries, write them down and refocus the, the, your child's mind. And you can do that through um, different ways like distractions, which we'll talk about in a moment. Here it is. And so you could do things like the letter game, counting game, so picking a number and adding it um, to the number before to see how far you can get. Um, grounding is a good one, as I talked about before, using those five senses um, to encourage them to come back and to calm down and, and focus on what's now rather than what they have um, going on in their, their head or if they're overthinking as well. 
Um, and I think I've just mentioned this, um, and I may have mentioned this before, we do ha now have a mental health and wellbeing section on our website, and I'm hoping this um, workshop will be on there as well very soon. But here is where you can find um, information about um, the mental health and wellbeing that we do across the school, what we do for the children, all about the zones and the toolbox for the zones. And we've also got some numbers and websites there that might be useful for external um, support as well. And um, just to say, if you are concerned about your child's mental health and wellbeing, you feel that it is, it is really um, affecting their wellbeing and quality of life, please make sure that you do speak to a teacher um, because we have our mental health and wellbeing policy, which has now been finalised um, on our website. And we have a process to go through now, um, which involves meeting with the teacher and also um, completing a record of concern um, so we can try and support your child as best as um, we can. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, thank you very much for listening.